In this video, I'll guide you through how to write your ERC application. I will focus on the two scientific parts and the administrative one, explain how each one is structured, and share some key questions to ask yourself before you start drafting your project. My name is Daniele Mammoli, and I work as scientific officer in the area of physical chemistry at the ERC Executive Agency. Applying for an ERC grant is a rigorous process that requires original and groundbreaking research project. Before starting to write, read carefully the documents available in our portal. They are extremely important since they keep you updated on current rules. Pay special attention to the ERC work program and to the information for applicants. An ERC application consists of several documents. They include the idea of your project, your CV, and track records, the management strategy, the budget plan, as well as other annexes. After submission, these documents will be organized by us into two scientific parts, namely Part B1 and Part B2, and into an administrative one, Part A. I will start with the two scientific parts first, since they are crucial for the selection process. Part B1 is about making a first good impression. You need to show the groundbreaking nature of your project and capability to carry it out successfully. Part B2 is about presenting the details of your project, such as the methodology, risk assessment, and implementation plan. Finally, Part A is the administrative part, which includes the budget plan, as well as a series of important annexes. Now, I'm going to describe them all, one by one. Part B1 consists of a description of your idea, a CV, and a track record of achievement. It is like your business card. In fact, Part B1 is the only document that is assessed at the first phase of our evaluation process. Step 1. Here, the reviewers in the panel act as generalist. This means that they cover a broad spectrum rather than being specialists in the subject of your work. The main goal of Part B1 is to convince the panel that your research is original, with potential to be groundbreaking, and that you are the right person to lead it. If you succeed in this first step, you'll move on to the second phase of the evaluation. Step 2. There, both generalists and experts will evaluate your whole application. For more info on the ERC evaluation process, you can watch our video on this topic. Now I will describe in more details how to write your idea, your CV, and your track record. You should describe your idea in a convincing way. State why it has potential for groundbreaking scientific achievements. You should not provide extensive information on the methodology, which you can develop in Part B2. However, show that your project is ambitious yet realistic. Explain the connections among your goals instead of just giving a shopping list of tasks. Whenever possible, mention briefly any supporting evidence and your risk plan. This way, panel members will be more convinced to explore your project as step two. All in all, you should leave a good impression, but also be careful not to oversell. Give a honest presentation of your project and how it fits into the works of others. In terms of structures and formatting, you should use the template as much as possible. Stick to the page limit, use paragraphs, Avoid excessive highlighting and use of bold, as it makes the text very difficult to read. Make sure you do not have any typos, because they could make the project look careless. Let me give you four questions you should ask yourself before writing your Part B1. 1. Is my project potentially groundbreaking? Think big and ensure your idea is something that can be funded by the ERC. You must clearly justify why your project has the potential to be groundbreaking. Emphasize its novelty with respect to similar efforts in other labs. These are key questions panel members will consider, so you should critically assess them yourself. 2. Are my goals ambitious yet realistic? Be ambitious, but not overambitious. In fact, projects are not funded when considered either incremental or unrealistic. Set challenging goals, but with reasonable chances of success. There is a rumor that in order to be successful, you need preliminary results, 
This is not necessarily the case, but you must explain how literature supports your hypothesis. In a nutshell, find the right balance between promising the impossible and going on with the same old safe line. 3. Can a non-expert understand and support my idea? As step 1, panel members act as generalists. Therefore, write Part B1 in a structured and accurate way. Use the evaluation criteria to structure your project. For instance, you could write headings like groundbreaking nature or potential impact. Avoid heavy jargon, abbreviations or extensive technical details. Do not assume panel members know everything within your field. Instead, explain the most important aspects of your idea. 4. Why now? Explain why this is the right moment to fund your project. If your idea was pursued in the past, tell why it was not realized. Describe why the scientific progress is now mature for your idea. For instance, highlight how recent technologies or discoveries could support your work. Let me now move to your CV and track records. Here, you should highlight your merits and ability to execute the proposed research. You do not have to be the best researcher in your field, but rather the right person to carry out your project. My main advice is to tell your story as factually as possible, without forcing evaluators to guess important aspects, such as expertise, independence, or creativity. Describe your scientific path, your achievements, your roles, and the impact of your past work. Highlight your key strengths and accomplishments in an objective way. Include research achievements, such as selected publications, prizes, invitations to conferences, and so on. Do not report them as a mere shopping list. Instead, explain what you have achieved, why it was important, and what was your precise role. If needed, you can also describe the publishing habits of your field. You may add some numbers and quantitative measures of your track record. Do not misunderstand me, it's not your age index that will determine the success of your application. In fact, bibliometrics are not used as standalone criteria, but are rather contextualized, taking into consideration your field and your career stage. Since panel members will look at your records, provide them with a link to your updated publication list, such as an Orchid ID. Do not let them wander give them the whole picture, make their life easier. In terms of publication, it is important to publish your work in journals that maintain a high quality peer review process. However, note that their impact factor is not important because it will not be used to assess the excellence of your articles. Finally, feel free to describe any other activity that could indicate scientific maturity and engagement within your community. You may mention fruitful collaboration, being a member in a committee, or acting as the editor of a journal. If there are any gaps or potential issues in your CV, you may want to explain them, although it's not compulsory to provide extensive details. In terms of format, again, use the recommended template as much as possible. Let me now give you four questions you should ask yourself about CV and track record. One. Why am I the right person to carry out this project? You must demonstrate to have the necessary expertise to execute the project. You and your team should be the primary driving force. Collaborations are meant to complement missing expertise or facilities. In a nutshell, it should be clear that you are leading the project and you are able to do it successfully. Two, have I already shown creativity, leadership, and independence. This is very important if you are a starting or consolidator grant applicant, given your early career stage. You do not necessarily have to be fully independent. However, you should show that you are the intellectual owner of your project and that your research line is different from the one of your former supervisors. If possible, list your funded grants and supervision experience. Keep in mind that leaving them out will not penalize your application. That said, if you apply for an advanced grant, a recent track record of achievements and your role in mentoring young scientists could be important. 3. Should I really be the world expert within my field? Rumor has it that you can only apply for an ERC grant if you are a highly accomplished scientist. This is not true. 
Your achievements are evaluated in relation to your field and seniority. 4. Do I need publication in high-impact journals to succeed? The answer is no, no, no. This is a false rumor, since the impact factor of a journal is not used to assess your application. Instead, it is much more important to provide evidence of creativity, leadership, and independence. Let us now move on with part B2. It consists of a detailed explanation of how you will implement the project. You should describe your research methodology, outline your work plan, and include a risk assessment. This part is only evaluated as step two by both generalists and expert reviewers. So you will have to find the right balance in the level of detail. At this stage, reviewers will check that your project meets the highest standards by scrutinizing your methodology and how your work fits into the current state of the art. That's why it's really important that you try to anticipate all possible technical questions and that you know the literature extremely well. You may intuitively think that it makes more sense to write part B2 after part B1, but actually many people prefer to do the opposite. A bit like writing the abstract of an article only after having written the paper itself. Explore your hypothesis, describe it deeper, give more details on the methodology and feasibility, and provide supporting evidence whenever possible. Do not be scared to add details on the techniques you wish to use or on the specific systems or phenomena you want to study. Panel members have to understand what you plan to do. You should clearly outline your management strategy, demonstrating how you'll carry it out and monitor the project over time. I personally recommend including a concise timeline, along with a brief description of how you will track progress and manage your risks. Make sure to also describe the roles and responsibilities of the PI and the team members. In addition, you have to include a funding ID, which lists all of your ongoing grants and applications. Within this section, provide a honest assessment of possible overlaps with your ERC project. Regarding for mapping, the guidance provided for Part B1 also applies here. Follow the template, stay within the page limits, use clear formatting with proper paragraphs and headings, avoid overusing bold or highlights, and finally, ensure the text is free of typos. Let me now give you four questions you should ask yourself about Part B2. One, are my midgets appropriate? Justify why your chosen methods are the best fit for your goals. Do not hide details on how you want to use them. Explain their quantitative and qualitative differences with respect to the state of the heart. Highlight their pros and cons. Describe your experience with them. Overall, the idea here is to prove that the methods are suitable to carry out your project and that you can master them. Two. Do I need a contingency plan? Yes, having a contingency plan is important. Since ERC projects are ambitious, you should list the main risks of your project and provide alternative strategies to mitigate them. This demonstrates preparedness and increases credibility. It is usually sufficient to include a risk assessment plan. You don't need to add a dissemination or management plan. Three, is the implementation plan clear? Part B2 should be easy to read for both generalists and experts. I personally suggest to include a concise timeline with milestones and deliverables. Describe the responsibilities of the PI and of each team member. Be sure your figures are easy to read and understand. Use the full space available and make sure you give the full references. Aim to be complete yet focus as excessive details can distract from your core ideas. Four, is there a balance between the scientific parts? Yes, it's important to maintain a balance between part B1 and part B2. Avoid putting all your effort into part B1 while leaving part B2 underdeveloped, as this can disappoint reviewers. Make sure you allocate enough time to craft a well-structured and cohesive project. Dedicate sufficient effort to write both part B1 and part B2. 
Finally, let me spend a few words on part A, the administrative one. In this section, you will need to provide declarations regarding the host institution and the principal investigator. You should also discuss the ethical and security aspects of the research, and most importantly, its budget. If you want to learn more about the ethics part specifically, there's a dedicated video covering that topic in detail. The panel considers a budget analysis as step two. Let me reassure you that your project will not be accepted or rejected based on budgetary reasons only. Nevertheless, panel members will have to scrutinize your budget to ensure that the requested resources are reasonable and justified. For example, they may wonder whether it is really needed to hire that number of postdocs or to purchase that piece of equipment. Exceptionally, the panel can even decide to make cuts to the budget, justifying them on a one-by-one -one basis. My main advice is to ensure that the budget you request matches what is really needed to carry out your project successfully. Do not inflate your budget, not even if your host institution asks you to do so, because the panel will likely realize it. Also, keep in mind that there is no punishment for projects that do not ask for the maximum budget allowed. Another tip is to make sure to include fees for open access, as this is a compulsory requirement for most outputs of your project. In addition, these are eligible costs, which can be charged to your grant, so it would be very unwise not to include them. Finally, be aware that there are different cost models for our calls. For instance, advanced grant calls are using the lump sum model, which is different from the actual cost model used in other calls. Consult the official documents to find out the specific requirements of the cost model of the call to which you are applying. And now a few final recommendations. Let me remind you that all ERC grant applications must be submitted exclusively through the funding and tenders portal of the European Commission. This online platform is the central access point for submitting projects and managing grants. To use the portal, applicants must first create an EU login account. It's really important to get to know the portal's layout and requirements well before the deadline, so you don't run into any last-minute problems. Please do not leave proofreading and submission until the very last day. Make sure you regularly save a version of your project on the portal. Keep in mind that each time you submit, it replaces the previous version, so only the final version you upload before the deadline will be considered. Before the final submission, write and rewrite your project until you are fully satisfied with it. Also, seek feedback for researchers you trust, if possible. We have now reached the end of this video of how to write your ERC application. I discussed essential aspects of Part B1, Part B2, providing 12 important questions you should ask yourself. In addition, I've also talked about Part A and the budget preparation. I know that writing an ERC project is challenging, and I'm confident that this video will help you tackle this big endeavor. My final recommendation is to remain persistent in face of setbacks and rejections. In fact, your chances of success are higher at the second or third attempt. So if this is not the first time you apply, I strongly suggest reading carefully the feedback you received in the previous round. If you are interested in the interview process, make sure you check out our video on that topic. Thank you for listening to me and I wish you all the best with your application.